So uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to uh, Programming with Qt Quick. Um, this is going to be a lot of material for the next eight hours or so. Your brains are going to be very full. This is actually a condensed version of what usually amounts to about a three-day class. So what we're going to be doing is there's going to be um, a lot of lecture. Generally, in this class, there would be uh, time for labs, and you'd actually do hands-on programming. Uh, for today, we are going to be going over the solutions to the lab and explaining them and uh, getting in through as much material as we can. Um, as we're going through material, uh, feel free to uh, raise your hand if you have any questions. Uh, we do have a, a room proctor. They will bring a microphone around. So uh, you can ask your question into the microphone and uh, we can get it on the recording. So before we start, I'd like to just ask a uh, few questions of the audience. How many people here are um, C++ Qt programmers, have done widget-based programs before? Right, pretty much everybody. Um, how many people here write desktop applications? Okay. How many people write uh, applications that run on embedded systems? Oh, yeah, fair amount. And how many people here are targeting uh, mobile phones? Okay. Um, how many people here have used Qt Quick or QML before? And um, how many people here have C++ code they would like to use with Qt Quick that they may have previously used? All right. Sounds like a uh, sounds like this is the right place for you. Uh, basically, what we're going to be talking about today is the very basics of, uh, of Qt Quick and QML, um, what it means to make items and components and how to lay them out. We're going to talk about how allowing the user to interact with your application via touching or clicking or using a keyboard or keypad. We will also talk about states and transitions. The concept of animations and state machines are actually built into the QML language. It's going to help you if you have an embedded device whose user interface roughly maps to a state machine and you want fancy animations to happen when you transfer from state to state. Uh, this is actually stuff that's built into the language. So previously in C++, you would have had to write a lot of code using Qt state machine and Qt property animations. This has become a lot easier. We're going to talk about using data models in your code, whether it's data models that you make directly in QML or data models that you make in C++ and export them into QML. And those would just be abstract item models for those that are familiar with that. We're going to talk about taking your QML code and making modules out of it. Modules in QML are analogous to libraries in C++. So you can take your uh, components, make them generic, making them distributable so that you can make maybe a generic set of uh, user interface components that you can use maybe across your company or across projects. And finally, we're going to talk about integrating QML with C++, how to use C++ objects in QML and how to allow QML items to actually have C++ backends where the user of your QML module might not even know that this module has C++ in it or whether it's written in, say, JavaScript. And we'll talk about the different approaches because there's actually three or four different ways uh, to get your C++ and your QML talking together. So let's jump into the super basics. Basically, what we're going to talk about is what QML actually is. Uh, QML is a new user interface language. It's actually a declarative language, which means that writing QML is more like writing web pages than it is like writing C++. There's going to be a defined layout to your code, and um, it's very basic. In fact, it's meant for non-C++ programmers to use, such as you know, technical people on your art staff. So we're going to talk about um, elements and identities. So you're going to be making these elements, and you're basically going to give them names so you can reference them later. And we're going to talk about how to use some of the layouts so that you could position your items via dead reckoning or say, I want this item just smacked up against this item, and they will forever follow each other around. 
So um, some people ask all the time, so what's the difference between Qt Quick and QML? Well, the answer is that QML is just the programming language. Qt Quick is actually a collection of things. It includes the language, which is QML. It includes the runtime, a C++ runtime to run your QML in. It includes the Qt Creator IDE support for QML, um, a graphical design tool, and the debugging utilities. So it's kind of a marketing umbrella for everything having to do with QML. Not just the language, but all the tools and runtimes that go along with it. So part of the idea is that um, it is very touch-oriented system and very design-oriented system. The idea is that your user interface designers can take the lead um, when it comes to defining how the application looks. Uh, those people in your design staff or your art staff who are familiar with things like HTML and uh, CSS and JavaScript um, should be familiar enough to actually use and work with the QML language. You can actually use tools from Nokia such as a Photoshop export tool where a Photoshop prototype could be generated into actual QML code that the designer can then give to you. The idea is, is to hand the pixels over to the designer and let the programmers worry about the code. So it's entirely designed around being design oriented and very, very quick to write things in. Um, so that you can take your prototype and reuse it. You can make changes very quickly to the user interface um, and it has very easy deployment. You can basically bundle all your QML files into a single binary and distribute it. So um, when it comes to user, intuitive user interfaces, since the introduction of things like the iPhone and these fancy effects that make the devices seem more real, um, you can actually touch the screen and move switches and as you swipe, you see the switches actually move. You can actually slide dials up and down. Um, these are what people have come to expect, especially in the embedded device market, that the animations um, are fluid, that the animations make the device seem more real, um, and the, um, they map to real world objects. And this is the philosophy that Cute Quick was designed under, so that it is designed so that it's very easy to do these animations, these states, and these transitions. It's built directly into the language. So uh, for those from the desktop world, you'll probably find that for right now, QML is of limited benefit on the desktop. Um, it's really meant to uh, create very custom looking user interfaces. Um, that are generally used on one device. There are these things called Qt components, which we're not going to cover here today. And Qt components are actually widget sets for different devices. So there's a Qt components version for Symbian, Qt components for Mego, Qt components for uh, Mego Harm Hatton, which is the N9. Um, and there is under development Qt components for desktop. So if you're looking to write a standard desktop application, um, that looks like Mac on the Mac, looks like Windows on the Windows, and looks like you know, KDE or GNOME on Linux, that is coming. Uh, right now, the, um, the goal has been for devices, uh, whether it's embedded or mobile phones. So for rapid prototyping, everything in QML is either the declarative QML language that can include embedded JavaScript. So we'll find that when we put these files together, there is the declarative portion and the JavaScript portion. Um, and we'll find out what the difference is as we go through the slides. What it looks like is it looks a lot like cascading style sheets um, and doesn't require a lot of programming knowledge to work with. Another interesting feature of QML is that it's also network transparent. You can actually, everything is based on URLs. So whether you're loading images to display on the screen or you are simply um, using QML files and loading components, those can actually come from the web or over the network. And your, load, your images will be loaded asynchronously.
So just a little more before we dive into actual code. So um, QML is basically a user interface description language is the best way that I could describe it. Um, basically, it is made up of a, a number of elements in a tree, and those elements have properties that you can manipulate. For example, this rough diagram here is a simple um, set of items in QML. We have a rectangle that is the black outer portion. We have an image that's the rocket ship. And we have some text, which is the cute quick part. And these actually have, just like cute widgets have, a parent-child hierarchy. And you uh, can position them either via layouts, via anchors, or just simple XY dead reckoning. And you'll see that the uh, text has properties for its font, say point size or pixel size and its color. An image has things like X, Y, and its source. Its source is the image it's going to load. So this is pretty much hello world in QML. It's the simplest QML application you can write. It basically displays a light blue rectangle on the screen. Um, you'll notice that there is an import statement at the very top of the file. This is like an include statement. This says that I want to include all the items from cutequick 1.0. This is going to help you keep um, compatibility as cutequick evolves over the years. So that right now there's a cutequick 1.1. However, if you say import cutequick 1.0, you're guaranteed to get all the features and all the behaviors of 1.0 and not the behavior changes that may have been introduced in 1.1. Uh, we make ourselves a rectangle object and set a number of properties. You'll notice that the properties are set with colons, um, and this is the binding operator in QML. And this is actually a very powerful tool that we're going to find um, out later is going to actually bind these values together. These are all static values, so binding isn't as important. In this case, you can sort of think of them as assignments. But we basically want a small rectangle displayed on the screen. And that's it. Initially starts off, has 400, 400, but the top level item will grow when you resize the screen. So another um, interesting feature is that you don't actually need to compile this code. You can run it with the QML viewer runtime. Um, this is built into Creator, so you could actually edit a QML file, hit Control R, and it will run it through QML viewer. Or from the command line, you can run QML viewer rectangle.qml. In fact, you could write entire applications that run entirely inside of QML viewer. It's a very powerful tool. QML viewer is even smart enough to load things like those QML libraries that we'll talk about making at the end of the uh, session. It can also include QML imports that have C++ built into them. So um, the import statement is a guarantee of the functionality that you're going to be getting. Um, the Comment structure is C and C++ style, so slash slash and star, um, slash star are the um, ways to define comments. And, rec and items are basically um, instantiated and you wrap them in curly braces to define the scope of your property changes. So it's in, these, in this scope is where you're going to be making child items as well as setting properties, introducing, and writing functions. So the actual amount of items in the QML toolkit is very small. We're going to find out that there's really only rectangles, images, um, text, text input, um, and, um, and mouse areas and uh, gesture areas. And using these very primitive components, you can actually make things like buttons and checkboxes very quickly. Um, you could also choose to use prepackaged things like those cute components. So what are elements? 
Things like rectangles, text, text input are all visual items. And visual items all inherit from a base type of element called item. Um, item is the, um, is, you can think of it as the base class that provides things like x, y, width, and height, and the ability to take up space on the screen. It is also the base for layouts and anchors. There are also some non-visual elements that we're going to be using, such as states, transitions, models, gradients, um, timers, these types of things that you will have in your file as items, but they won't be displayed on the screen. Um, they actually don't inherit from item. They would inherit from a thing called cute object. So you can make your own items, and you can inherit from items, and you can extend them with properties and functions, and so on. In fact, even in this simple example with the rectangle, we're actually making a specialization of a rectangle right here, because we're making an instance and changing its properties. If we put this into its own file, we'll find out that we have just made our own item. So um, some properties, most of them are very simple. You're going to have um, a type and a name. So things like width, height, x, y, and color. Um, generally, these are going to have default values, and they're all documented inside of the documentation, whether it's in the web, assistant, or directly inside Qt Creator. Um, there is a special property called the ID property. And if you use the ID property, that is how you can then reference that item elsewhere in the QML file and basically use that item as a variable. Um, you can use this to change the behavior or the look of the item as the user interacts with the user interface. So for example here, we have um, some basic properties. So we make a text element, and we set its text property to a static string, and we set some height. Um, likewise, we have a text item, and we set its font family and its font pixel size. When you see the, um, uh, this property grouping where it says font, there's an extra dot and basically a sub-element. These are called grouped properties. And things like elements and anchors um, are grouped properties. And this is a, um, it makes it easier to read and to write the code. We also have the last one, which is an identifier called label, which we default the text here to hello world. But since now this label has an identifier, we can actually somewhere else in the QML application call label.text equals something else and change its text dynamically. So you can think of these IDs as variable names. Yes? So the scope of the ID is actually um, pretty broad. So the scope is going to be within, your, uh, within the file that you're in um, and anything, um, any of your child items that you make below you will also have access to that identifier. And it uses the JavaScript lookup rules, where it's going to first look for the identifier locally, um, then it's going to go up in the, uh, in the QML namespace and finally get to global namespace. So once you set an identifier, this is the label is valid for the file that you're in. Um, and it is also valid if you made children of the text item. Uh, maybe you made a rectangle or something underneath it. You could use the ID inside of there as well. So the scoping is very broad. So there are also uh, things called attached properties that look a lot like grouped properties. And these only appear under certain conditions, um, such as in the text input, we have a key navigation property. This defines uh, what happens to focus when tab, back tab, left, right, up, and down are pressed. Um, and that's going to vary widely per application and per keypad. How do you move from one element to the other? The key navigation element is going to help you do that. And there's an entire section on that. Um, it is actually turns out to be a lot easier to write and maintain than it is to do tab ordering in C++. 
You can also make your own custom properties on any item, whether it is an instance of an item or it's an item that you put in your own file which becomes instantiable. So here we're making a rectangle and we're adding a property called mass whose type is real. The real type in QML is analogous to float. Um, it actually is going to depend on what platform you are, you're on, but it's going to be uh, whatever is most expedient for your platform. So in the ARM architecture, it's generally going to be float. On x86, it'll be double, um, only because they're faster. So um, we talked about this concept of binding, which is actually going to be really, really useful. It's going to save us a lot of code. In fact, you'll notice here on this slide that we're making a parent-child hierarchy. So we have an item, and underneath that, we have a rectangle. We set a static width and height on the top level item, but our rectangle's width is special. Our rectangle's width is defined as our height times two. And what this means is that this is a binding, not an assignment. So QML is smart enough to know that when you use a variable in a binding, a property, whether it's your property, somebody else's property, that any time any of the properties uh, change within an expression, it is going to rerun all expressions that include that variable. So any time height changes, it is going to recalculate the width of this object. And this is all done because of cute properties that include read, write, and notify signals. So built into the language is the concept of QT signals. So every property gets an automatic signal on x, y, x, on x changed, on y changed, on height changed. And the bindings are smart enough to automatically subscribe to the signal and rerun the code any time the variables change in that expression. So you'll, you'll see that that is the sort of power of that colon operator. It's not the assignment operator. It's much more powerful. So IDs are also useful because then you can have access to your elements um, so that you can change them dynamically. And you can also use these IDs to lay out your dialogues and your screens to say that I want one item to be positioned relative to another item. And you're going to use these quite a bit. So general rule of thumb is almost every item that you have that's not just a simple container is probably going to have an ID. So for example here, we are making an item and underneath that, a text and a rectangle. The text element um, it has an ID of text element. And we'll notice that the rectangle width is being set to the text element's width. This is just another example of binding, but instead of using one of our own properties, we're actually using a property of text element. Once again, anytime the width of text element changes, the width of this rectangle is going to change. So methods in QML are JavaScript functions. And there are a number of QML elements that come out of the box with functions, such as the text input has a select all. The timer has start and stop and restart, and particles has burst. Particles is actually a, um, you can think of it like a firework type of, um, um, type of item that you can configure it to do sort of burst patterns. Very helpful for doing things like games. There is also the concept of the QT global object. This is actually, you can think of this like a namespace. And you can use it to do things like format date times, do MD5 sums, and do color manipulations. Um, so when you're getting started with Qt Quick, I would look up the Qt global object and read all the functions that it has, because it has a lot of useful things in it that you might not know where to look for them.
So there are some basic types in QML, such as um, the numbers are int and real, basically an integer object and a floating point object. There's Booleans, um, there's strings, and there are certain constants, such as a line left. And even some objects like the text element and the font elements are going to have these constants set. So when you want to set alignments, um, you can do them in a sane way. It's just not strings. Um, there is the concept of lists, uh, which is very much like JavaScript. All you do is uh, instantiate uh, a property or a variable with the brackets, and you can make a list of objects. And you can include scripts in your application. So entire JavaScript files that have their own scoping and namespace. And there are also um, types for like colors, dates, times, points, rectangles, and actually one that's used in uh, QML 3D, which is a 3D vector element. So that is the uh, basic, basic, basics of, uh, of QML. There's some uh, very um, small amount of items that you can build up into more complex things. There's the concept of binding and identifiers. Properties are bound and not assigned in the QML declarative section. And you can uh, define functions. There's a number of predefined functions. And there are a small array of built-in items and types. One thing that's interesting to note about the, what I call the QML section of this, well, QML file, is that all of these items, the creation, and the storage and signals and slots uh, for these particular items is read at runtime, and item, text, and rectangle actually become C++ objects that are, man uh, that are instanced, they are managed, animated, and drawn in C++. So when you look at this file and you look at Qt Quick in general, people see, oh, it's a lot of JavaScript. This is being processed all the time. We're in the declarative section the QML runtime is going to load all of this basically into C++. It is the JavaScript snippets, that I call them, that are actually uh, run and interpreted over and over again. Um, and things that you might not think are JavaScript really are, such as that assignment of that width to width is, e is bound to height times 2. That's actually a snippet of JavaScript and is going to be run by the JavaScript interpreter every time with changes. We're going to find later that it's going to be pretty easy to identify when you're writing this code what's QML and what's JavaScript. Uh, mostly because anything you want to do that's complicated in JavaScript is going to require you to put brackets. Um, if there was more than one line, you would need um, curly braces um, around text element width. Does anybody have any questions so far? I know it's been pretty basic up to here. Yep. One more. Oh. Yeah. It's it's um it's both. It's um the entirety of this file gets that identifier, as well as children. No. There, in any given QML file, there can only be one top-level item in the file. And that is usually a generic item, or it's going to be something called a focus scope, which if you want to do keypad navigation, I say the general rule of thumb is everything starts with focus scope, which is a focus proxy object. We'll talk about uh, probably around lunchtime. Yep. So, so what about game creation? I mean, say you have a flow, so it has a web behind you. Can you pass me the mic? Yeah. So within the same file, you cannot use the same identifier twice. It's pretty much the rule. 
But outside of the, if you have two different QML files and say that you had the rectangle file and this particular file, you could overlap identifiers in two different files. But you can't overlap identifiers within the same QML file. They need to be unique. Uh, and there's actually a couple more rules on top of that. So the names need to be unique uh, within a given file. Um, the names have to start with a letter. And the only valid characters are letters, numbers, and underscore. Yes. Um, and in fact, there's, um, there's a bit of an enforced naming convention when it comes to properties as well. Anytime you uh, make yourself a property, it has to start with a lowercase letter. I'm not sure about IDs. I never tried to make one with an uppercase letter. But I'm seeing shaking heads in the crowd, so I'm going to say no. Yes? Yes. Yep. Yes. Yeah, after. So, yeah. So, what's going to happen here is we have this uh, property real mass. And so, there's an automatic signal we can catch called on mass changed. Uh, or actually, actually, the signal's called mass changed. We're going to find out that there's also automatic slots we get, such as on mass changed. And inside of on mass change is called after the value actually changes. So this, this property basically get, is, a, is a get, a set, and a um, signal. And you can let bindings take care of it for you, or you can subscribe to them yourself. All right. So now we're going to talk about more interesting things, such as how to nest the elements and uh, lay them out, and what types of elements um, are there, and what are their um, features. And we're going to talk about a really powerful thing called anchor layouts, which is something that's not um, available in C++ widgets, um, but is the standard layout tool for QML. So just like widgets in C++, um, elements are often nested in a parent-child hierarchy. Um, there are some distinct differences, though, between widgets and QML items. The first and biggest one is that QML items do not clip their children. They will provide a coordinate system, but if you tell an item to live at negative 100 and negative 100 is still on the screen and your parent is here, the child will gladly display at negative 100 coordinates. We're going to find that not clipping makes graphics and animations a lot easier and a lot faster. If you need clipping on any particular item, you can actually set a property called clip to true. So um, you should write your code assuming there is no clipping. Try not to turn it on. But when you have to, such as when you're dealing with lists and you want to you know, flick scroll things and have a fancy frame around it, uh, be judicious in your set clip true. We're going to talk about um, dealing with colors, images, and gradients, and doing alignments and anchors. So we can position items not on dead reckoning, x, y, width, and height, but on relationships. We want to stuff this object in the upper right-hand corner of the screen and have it stay there, regardless of how the screen changes. So here's an example of a uh, set of nested elements. Once again, we have the top level rectangle and a rectangle in that and yet another rectangle. And what this is really meant to show you is the uh, propagation of coordinate systems, is that the parent's role here is to provide a coordinate system to its child. This is much the way that Q widgets work. So the coordinate system for the interior green rectangle starts at a 0, 0 position relative to the 0, 0 of its parent. 
Likewise, the white rectangle on the inside, its coordinate system is defined by the green rectangle. However, if we set the white rectangle to display at coordinates, you know, negative 100, y150, it will gladly display over the blue section. You'll also notice here that we are setting our colors by these strain names. And these names actually come from the scalable vector graphic specification. So if you're looking for a giant list of these, check out the World Wide Web Consortium's documentation on SVG. So there's also other ways of specifying colors, such as what I call HTML syntax, where you say uh, pound and give it um, six digits for your standard 24-bit RGB and eight digits if you want RGBA. You can also set these using the Qt global objects um, RGBA function. And these are actually set in uh, percentages of the amount of red, green, blue, and alpha you want. Um, rather than going from 0 to 255, uh, this uh, naming convention goes from 0 to 1. While this might not be the kind of thing that C++ programmers are used to, this is the color conventions that artists are going to be more used to. There is also a concept of opacity, which also goes from 0 to 1. So here's an example here of having uh, three rectangles uh, using dead reckoning to uh, set them into a row. And we are setting colors by HTML syntax, by the cute global objects RGBA, and by simply SVG name of blue. So generally, I suggest for your project, you find the one that works best for you, your designers, your programmers, and try to stick with one the entire way through. Uh, the image item is probably the most powerful thing in QML, especially when it comes to embedded uh, UIs. Generally, everything can be reduced down to an image or set of images. Like you think of a button. A button really has a unpressed image and a pressed image, and you can make that button look however you want. Basically, it's up then to the designer just to give you the pix maps that make it look correct for whatever their vision happened to be. Now, the image has a source property. And the source property is actually a URL. So you can give this a local file. You could give this a file out of the Q resources using QRC colon slash. Or you could give it something off of the web, and it will go fetch it using its own Q network access manager. All of the pathing is relative to your QML file. So any paths that you use in QML are not related to the present working directory of the application. It is relative to the location of this QML file. So if you go grab a QML component like straight off the web and have it dynamically loaded, and its image paths were relative to it, that means all of its images will also be fetched over the web. Um, images have some really nice conveniences built into them, such as scaling and rotation. And when you rotate an image, it will rotate it about the center of the image. Um, unlike how uh, you know, painter uh, transformations work, where by default rotates about the uh, upper left-hand corner. So here, for example, is the rocket ship. We are making a black rectangle for the outside, and then we're making an image that is relative to dot dot slash images rocket dot png. Now, if this QML file was embedded via Q resources, then this dot dot slash images rocket png is going to be looked up in your Qt resources. 
because all the file pathing is local to wherever this file came from. Um, another convenience of the image is that it gets an automatic width and height that defaults to the width and height of the actual image. You can override that, um, but it is automatic for you. You can also define a scale factor for your images. So you might load an image and you might scale it, maybe by 2x, or maybe by 0.5x. And you can basically dynamically grow and shrink your images. Uh, by default, this will use a fast scaling algorithm. There is another property called smooth. And if you set smooth to true, it will use a smooth scaling algorithm. So the source can be either a, um, any of the files that Qt supports. So it could be a PNG file, a GIF file, or even a scalable vector graphic has this example. This example is also rotating the image uh, by 45 degrees. And the uh, transformation origin for images is preset so that all transformations happen about the center of the image. Yes? On the, uh, the format supported, that will, will that depend on whether QT itself is built with those formats supported, or does it wrap all that for you? Uh, no, it's going to depend on how your, your Qt was built. So if you don't have the JPEG 2000 plug-in, then no JPEG 2000. So, so they have to be, can they be loaded as a plug-in into Qt, or as long as the normal Qt app can find it, the Qt, the, uh, the Qt Quick, the Qt Quick will be able to find it? Exactly. It's gonna, if, if Qt can use it, Qt Quick can use it. Okay, thank you. Um, you'll actually find that if you've been tracking the new features in Qt over the last you know, five years or so, you'll see that they've been slowly ramping up towards, well, QML with the state machines and the property framework. So everything that is actually used to build Qt Quick, is, most of it's actually available to you in C++ via the native APIs, such as the Qt state machine, which drives a lot of this. Yes? I'm mm Well, it's always a bad idea to scale. Um, if you can have your graphic artist ship you another image and you have enough memory for an extra image, enough disk space for an extra image, it's always going to be better to do an image. Um, also, the same thing for gradients. While there is a gradient object, uh, for most embedded devices, it's usually easier and faster to have your button gradient be an image rather than having the main processor calculate the gradient all the time. Um, there is a lot of optimizations that have gone into, uh, into QML uh, with things such as the um, uh, like PixMap caching, um, so that on desktop platforms, it's a 10 megabyte PixMap cache. On embedded platforms, it's a one megabyte cache. So it's going to try to keep uh, like as many PixMaps um, as tolerable in memory. You can actually tune that yourself. You can also, uh, I don't know if it's covered by these notes, but you can dynamically uh, instantiate and delete your uh, QML screens, um, similar to the way you do in C++. So you can manage, this is a rarer screen for the user to pop up. So I'm going to just, when the user wants it, dynamically allocate it, show it. And when the user is done with it, I'll go ahead and delete it. Um, Yeah, so there is actually, so for this, yeah, even for this example, when you run this QML code, it is going to load a rectangle into memory, it's going to load this image into memory, and they will be in memory for the lifetime of that application. No. 
It's not, not that smart. It, uh, there is provided for you um, a thing called components that you can dynamically allocate things via the JavaScript interface using uh, component.createObject. And there's also a QML item called a loader. And what a loader does is it says, um, so if I wrap, you know, uh, basically image in a loader, then that loader is not actually going to create its element until I tell it to create its element. Well, that's going to de depend on the size of the QML files. So if you write you know, uh, thousands and thousands of QML files and expect to load them all at the same time, you're going to be very unhappy. Much like you know, in C++, if you made all your dialogues up front, you wouldn't be happy either. So you've got to decide which parts of your application are going to be uh, the most common for the user to use. Generally, you want to keep them in memory all the time. And which ones are least common for the user to use and dynamically create and destroy those. Yeah, I wouldn't say it turns it into C++ with constructors. It's actually making instances of, you know, queue declarative item in C++ and storing them, you know, in various C++ data structures to manage them. Um, but when you say, I want a rectangle, then that memory is allocated and it's stored for the lifetime of this application. Yes? Yeah. Um, okay. So in the in the context of the loader of the loader item, um, there is a there's a source we can give it a file name, or there's a source component where you could give it a something called a component we haven't talked about yet. And what you do is if you use the um, the source property on that, then when you want it to load, you set its source to a file name. When you want it to destroy, you set its file name to quote quote. Um, you can uh, set the source component and it will load the component, and you set the source component to undefined, and it will delete the component it had. Um, if you set the source on it twice, it will delete the, uh, the old component and make you a new one. Uh, in JavaScript, uh, you would use the components create object function. Then the objects you create from that have a destroy function that you will call, and it's basically the equivalent of the QT delete later. So it'll make sure to clear the event loop before it goes ahead and actually deletes that memory. Yes? Ah, so we're going to talk about that in, well, all right. So jumping ahead to the end of the notes. So QML is going to force you into a very model view pattern when it comes to interacting with your C++. What this means is that it's very easy to bind QML to objects from C++. And it's easy to call back from C, uh, QML back to C++. It is um, intentionally difficult to access items that live in QML from the C++ side. What this is going to do is going to force you into writing a uh, UI agnostic back end and exporting that back end into the GUI side. And then the GUI binds to the back end. And what you'll end up with is a lot cleaner code. Um, you can, if you jump through a lot of hoops, get access to the pointers that represent the rectangle item and manipulate them. Um, but if you go that route, you're going to, well, one, run into problems when they go to Qt, uh, Qt Quick 2.0 and, you know, the interfaces change, of course. Um, and um, also, um, you're going to be very tempted like you are in C++ in widgets where you say, oh, I have a list on the screen. Maybe I'll just use the list to store my data. Um, it has a bunch of items. Um, I'll just store my data there. And when you go to port your application or reuse your code, you'll find that there's, this, um, um, there's been this marrying of your UI to your back-end application code. Whereas uh, to design cleanly, you would have that list stored in C++ 
uh, without regard to how it's displayed on the screen and let your list bind to it. Yes? You're implying then that the trolls have done a better job of isolating out the GUI attributes from the view. Because right now there are quite a few roles that only exist in the view side of thing that really have nothing to do that, yeah. that, that your model has to return that are only for viewing and rendering. Well, it turns out in QML, the abstract item models work slightly differently. In fact, all the standard roles are ignored. You're going to uh, implement your own roles to uh, do as you decide. Generally, the way I suggest designing things is that you have a C++ data model that doesn't care about abstract item model at all. You have an abstract item model class that, say, um, you know, takes a pointer, maybe um, a reference to your C++ model. And it's simply a wrapper that is going to assign roles to lookups from your C++ data structure. And ironically enough, if you go down this route, you'll actually be easier to move your application away from QML or away from QT in general. The irony of it all. Um, and this is all covered at the end of the day when we talk about integration of C++ and QML. But it's all good things to keep in mind. Uh, the X, Y width and height is, yeah, it's in your item's coordinate system, which is defined by your parent. Uh, oh, the, your, your, uh, all transformations are propagated, uh, which means that if you rotate the parents, all the children are implicitly rotated. Uh, okay, try again. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's a situation I hadn't considered. Um, I'll look into that for you. I'm not, I'm not quite sure, and I can't think of off the top of my head, functions to uh, map from your, the child coordinate systems to the parent coordinate systems. But I can look into that. Yes? Yeah, QML, yeah, well, Q, uh, QML would be equivalent to the, you know, equivalent C++. So if you wrote an application in C++ that used, um, well, a lot of images, um, and used images to create its buttons, they would be comparable in the memory footprint. Um, the performance of uh, loading the application is, uh, is slower because you need to read all the QML files. And the... Um, the JavaScript sections need to be interpreted. So if you do really bad things in JavaScript, then your application is going to run slowly, just like if you do really bad things in C++. However, Qt Creator comes with a QML profiler that will profile your JavaScript and let you know where the slow sections are. So it will help you tune your JavaScript much like you would use a C++ profiler to tune your C++. Yes? Uh, there is no way to precompile. Um, however, the JavaScript back end will use just in time compiling. So you might get a benefit there for certain functions. Um, and uh, with Qt Quick 2.0, they're moving to the uh, Google Chrome V8 engine, uh, which has really fast JavaScript performance. Yes? Yep. That's very true. So um, 
you, there are ways where you could export a Q proxy widget uh, by inheriting from Q declarative item, uh, but proxy widgets are notoriously slow. So in the QML world, I would say avoid at all costs unless you have a really complex widget that you can't port, like a graphing tool, um, to not use any of the QT widgets. And while you might say uh, for a desktop application, obviously that's a huge hindrance. You don't have the native looking push buttons and radio buttons and tab stacks. Um, for embedded applications on devices and mobile phones, there's actually a lot of freedom involved um, in, have, in being able to create um, your components that look exactly like what you want. So for, if you're writing a desktop application, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, Right now, uh, QML is not the tool for you to write an application you want to run on Windows that looks like Windows. Yes? Yeah, well, this is, so there is a, there's also a UI design tool called QML Designer that's built into Creator. It can help you do the same drag and drop type of thing. Uh, very useful if you have the cute components loaded, like for Symbian or for Migo. Um, but there is no um, conversion utility or analogy between uh, design or UI files and, and this. But what is the benefit? This gets you your application. Well, you get a few things. One. Um, your application code uh, for a dynamic user interface, like things that are animating and is basically a state machine, is going to become very short. Um, and bindings are going to allow you in one line of code to basically cover what would normally take 10 lines of C++ to set it and perpetually keep it in sync. Here we're using bindings, which is going to save us a lot of code. And this is also a language in which um, like graphic designers or people on the design staff are going to be able to um, use and understand, as opposed to we'd want to keep them away from the C++ compiler. Yes? So along those lines of that, when you say the problem, is the designer and the right track? Yeah. Yeah. So there is a, um, there's actually two competing unit testing frameworks for QML. One's called QTest QML, and another one comes with uh, Creator. And I'm not sure um, how easy it is to separate out the one that's used for Creator. Uh, but on projects that I've worked on, we've basically, um, the designers are only work on layout and graphics. And for code that actually, well, runs, like the JavaScript se uh, segments, it's programmers write those. And every line of code is verified via unit testing. Any other questions? Um, I mentioned that images uh, default to uh, rotating about their center. And actually, all objects have this concept of a transformation origin. So that your, um, say, uh, not so useful maybe with the rocket ship, but for something like uh, maybe we're making a gauge with a needle. And the needle is a separate image. The gauge face is a separate image. And to set the gauge to a particular value, we just need to rotate that needle. But we need the needle not to rotate about the center but to rotate about its end. So um, all items have a transformation origin, and you can set that, um, either via x, um, x, y coordinates, or you can use things like top and bottom, left and right. 